do you want to get the source code and understand why this works or not? If you want to understand why this design is better than that design, I mean, you reverse engineering and you're saying, wait a minute, why does it have this extra little uh, uh, source of, why is there this extra degree of freedom here? Why is there this extra variable in the system? Now, maybe the answer is no reason at all. But it may be, oh, it needs that variable because in one state, that's representing too hot. And in the other state, it's representing not too hot. And, and, and so it goes. We use, so what, what, we use the, the comments on the source code to characterize the Are these heuristics the or are they literal, the, the, the comments? <laughs> because when Ken Hill did heuristics. this work... They're heuristics. He, when, when, they're heuristics, okay. Fine. Then I don't need to go any further. Is this, is this a convincing account? <clears throat> When Kandel did this work, he didn't, he, he didn't <laughs> have, make any um, commitments to aboutness of the states of the motor ganglia and, and the neural ganglia of the aplasia. Well, I'll have to look closely because I'm pretty sure I can find where he did. Uh, maybe heuristically, though. Yeah. Maybe in yeah. terms of, yeah. Absolutely. And, and but that's, uh, that's what matters. If you think about it, if you think about reverse engineering a, a computer program, and, and while you're doing this, writing comments which explain each little part. Now, those are, those are heuristics for the benefit of those who come later and want to understand how the thing works yeah. and why, and why the parts are organized is there. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very convenient way of interpreting the machinery that you've got of when you're doing your reverse engineering. Now, I think that's what me what meaning is, is the interpretation of the machinery in that exactly that sense. Now, if By you think us, as when we reverse engineer, yes, <clears throat> but Do you see why that's important. Yeah, but 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 then you want to know why does evolution preserve it? Yes. Why does evolution preserve it? And there's no bias because somebody's got to do the interpreting. But the interpretation by so let's go now from the aplasia to its interpretation by us. Just say the And what's what's the problem with that? Oh, oh, I think I know. All right. I just want to hear the last sentence one more time. Just that the comments on the reverse engineering are heuristics that we use in order to keep track, yeah. keep track of what is going on in the actual distribution of physical matter that constitutes the aplasia and its neural circuitry, mm -hmm. as opposed to attributions of properties to that circuitry like charge or pH or uh, mass or uh, protein composition. All right, so and the paper I sent around today on the, on the evolution of reasons goes into this. At the level of aplesia, the aplesia does lots of things for reasons, but the aplesia doesn't have, know anything about the reasons, doesn't represent the reasons, doesn't know the reasons. And doesn't have reasons. Doesn't have reasons, but does things for reasons. Right. That's where the terminology comes in. And, 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 well, we yeah. can talk about it. Well, well, wait a minute. Look, look, this is. It's just a fun. No, there, no, there's, there's Please let Don go on. Look, Dan, go on. There's reasons why, you know, trees spread their limbs and why they send their roots down. The trees don't understand that they don't need. They're the beneficiaries. But if you want to know why, asking for a reason, there's lots of reasons. And you can, these are reasons of reverse engineering. And we can do it. There's reasons why we sneeze and why we blink. Those aren't our reasons. We don't have reasons. For and, that, and those reasons are re are causes of a certain kind. Well, they are they are they're teleological reasons. They're answers to the question what for, not answers to the question how come. But there are things that help us understand in this yeah, yeah. efficiency sense. I mean, yeah. we could just talk about the atoms in the trees and we could, figure out what the trees do without ever referring. We'll be missing a lot. This goes back to, yeah. to Dan's right. point about the chat about bringing the wine home. Demon. Yeah. Right, the, yeah, that's right. His yeah. answer to your uh, uh, Laplacian demon. Exactly. I think, yeah. but that's that's my point. That is exactly the difference. Yeah. Which I think you know, so the, the meaning of meaning is in this 
efficiency, helpful, that's, shortcut. That's the point. That's the intentional stance. So now, Just the, the aplesia. The aplesia does things for reasons, but it doesn't appreciate reasons. It doesn't represent its reasons, but it does things for reasons. As we go up and get more complicated, eventually we get to organisms that have more elaborate nervous systems that don't just do things for reasons, but begin to represent their reasons. So, and and here's, here's where my mystery, here's where my mystery emerges. Because what we know from the work of Kandel and others is that in our hippocampus, it's exactly the same molecular and somatic gene process that happens in the aplasia. And the only difference is 10 to the 10th neurons instead of four neurons. And my problem is, how does this difference of degree produce real reasons? But reasons, that it, reasons that the brain has, well, which well, the aplasia, according to, as Dan rightly said, doesn't have. Well, to give well you let, me, let, let me, there's differences of degree and differences of degree. <laughs> let's, let's go way up and look at a case that I've been discussing for years, and that's the the uh, injury feigning in the, in the piping plover. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a cognitively controlled behavior. It's quite subtle, and experiments uh, that, for instance, um, um, I can't remember her name at the moment, did Carolyn um, Ristab did, that, yeah. that Carolyn Ristab did. We know that, that the, look, there are two possibilities. This is a sort of freak out behavior. The bird is just sort of having an epileptic seizure or it's actually very it's clever. A strategy. And it turns out it's, it's pretty darn clever because the piping plover is, is monitoring the predator, even monitoring whether the predator is gazing at her. And if, if the predator is looking away, she, she will stop. Ampli no, she will amplify her, her um, squatting to get his attention, right, and yeah. she'll let the predator get closer. So there's, there's a, a very subtle process by which the piping plover uh, uh, leads the predator away. Now, are there reasons why it's doing that? Yes. Does the piping plover understand them? No. The piping pl plover, again, is the beneficiary of having a nervous system that does things for reasons that the piping plover does not have to appreciate. So we have to go up some more. But the brains are getting bigger, and the capacities for representation are getting bigger. And just to cut to the chase, I am not going to say that animals are doing things that they have reasons for what they do until you get to us and a few of our closest kin. And here, the reason I'm going to talk about them actually representing reasons, well, let me go to the, to the easy case first, and I've already said this. When you're consciously representing reasons to yourself, you are, I mean, you really are thinking about these things. You really, there's actual processes in your head where the reasons themselves are represented. Dogs can't represent reasons to themselves. Chimpanzees can't represent reasons to themselves. I don't think. They can get close. Ruth Milliken suggests that when an animal can represent goals and actions in this sort of same space, we're getting close. And I think that there's something right about that, but it, it doesn't solve the problem because representation and space, these are tricky words and you can pull them in different shapes. But for the moment, I'm going to say, we're the only ones that represent our reasons. And the only reason we can represent our reasons is because in addition to having brains, we have language. And it is, it's because we're the symbolic species, it's because we have language that we can represent our reasons. And so that we can be sort of self-conscious intentional systems and be higher order intentional systems in a way that no other animal can be. And then we, with this power that we have, thanks to language, we can then look back at the whole tree of life. We can see all the reasons the reasons why sponges do what they do and why bacteria do what they do and why, why, why aplesia does what it does, we are, and it's heuristic, we are discovering the reasons why things happen. Darwin showed that 
all of these reasons could be honored without any representation of reasons by, a, by an intelligent designer. We're the first intelligent designers, and we're the first reverse engineers. Yeah, can I ask a question? So representation, if I were just, if I had to work in a lab, yeah. I would say it's a correlation between a neural state and an external state, right? So whenever there's a cat nearby, some cat part lights up in some systematic yep. way. That's just, it's a, it's a in, picture. In philosophy, you call that causal covariant information. But so is that, and let, I'll, let me just flesh it out and ask David if yeah. this is how it goes through, right? I'm sure if I look in the brain, I'll find, in a dog brain, I'll find correlations between neural firings. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, I, and so but, I, but you see, yeah. for the moment, uh -huh. I'm not going to call those representations. So what's the extra magic that you have to put in? There's all sorts of correlations in the brain. I'm sure that's the case, right? Why can't I say that what, what means that this part of the brain is not representing that part of the brain, even the dog, since I'll certainly find the correlations there? It's the feedback of the verbal tokens and the inscriptional tokens onto conscious tokens. Uh, well, <laughs> there, there's an answer, but it's not a short problem. answer. Okay, but you're, you're, you're saying that if I had a richer sense of represent, I would see why dogs had it and humans didn't have it, and I hopefully wouldn't no, have no, it. No, 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 the no, other, no, the other no, way. way. Oh, okay, sorry, yes. <laughs> Uh, yeah. I, I, if, if I had a slightly more sophisticated, yeah. if I just enriched my scientific theory representation, I would see why they didn't go through. That's what you're saying. You would see why, why precisely why a term like representation is so problematic, mm -hmm. and you could see what we might call the florid, robust, all-in concept of representation, mm -hmm. and those are things like words and pictures and maps, and then we can see. By, by um, uh, as it were, courtesy, once we get clear about what those are and see how people use them, how representation users use them, then we can look back on the brain and see, oh, there's something which is rather like a map mm -hmm. in, the, in the animal's brain, and we can see how, in effect, the animal brain uses this in, a, in the way that w people use maps. And if we don't find enough of a similarity in the processes of exploitation there. There was a, it's not really a map. It's sort of like a map, but it, don't think of it as a map because then you're then you're imputing too much of a map user, too much of a map right. reader to right. the system.